Live from Television City in Hollywood, brought to you by Chrysler Corporation, maker of these five great cars. Plymouth. Dodge. DeSoto. Chrysler. And the exclusive Imperial. Only Chrysler Corporation brings you the forward look. And now, Chrysler Corporation presents... Michael Rennie. Cedric Hardwick. Mary Sinclair. Starring in tonight's production of... Climax. Ladies and gentlemen, your host for Chrysler Corporation, Bill Lundigan. Good evening. Tonight on Climax, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde by Robert Louis Stevenson. Starring in this classic story of the conflict between good and evil are Michael Rennie, Cedric Hardwick, and Mary Sinclair. Mr. Rennie's appearance tonight was made possible through cooperation of 20th Century Fox Studios and his next starring role will be in the Cinemascope color production, Seven Cities of Gold. And now, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, adapted by Gore Vidal on Climax. Dr. Jekyll! Dr. Jekyll, are you all right? Go away! Please, sir, let me in! Go away! Either Dr. Zeke has gone or he has not. Now, which is it? I don't know, Mr. Utterson. I can't say, sir. Oh, it's been a most terrible time, sir. Over two weeks now, he's been locked in his laboratory, won't come out. We put his meals there by the door. Then after we go away, he takes them inside, if he's inside. Who else could be? Look, sir, here are two of the prescriptions he left with me only this afternoon. Now, you know Dr. Zeke's handwriting. Is that his hand? Very odd. Very odd indeed. Yes, but is it Dr. Jekyll's writing? Well, yes and no. I should say that on the great stress he might write like this. I'm begging your pardon, sir. I think it's the other. The other? What other? Oh, you know, sir. You will remember him. His friend, Hyde, his name was. But Hyde disappeared a year ago. He wouldn't dare to return to the police after him. I believe he's back, sir, and I believe he's done something to Dr. Jekyll. We shall pay a visit to Mr. Hyde. If it is he... Yes, sir. I should bring a pistol, sir, if I went into that room. Yes. You may be right. After all, he is a murderer. I shall never understand why Jekyll took up with him. I think he was what you might call an experiment, sir. Dr. Jekyll knew some very strange people. Even... murderers? <laughs> I said that, Jekyll, are you inside? Go away! It's Utterson. It's your friend, Utterson. Now let me in like a good chap. Leave this house! That's not Dr. Jekyll's voice. I was right, sir. There's someone else in there. You think it's Hyde? Sounds like him. If it's you, Hyde, let us in or we'll force the door. Where are you? Huh? 
Hyde, wasn't it? Yes, sir, it was Mr. Hyde. Do you think he's killed Dr. Jekyll? I don't know. I want you to go to the police, tell them that the murderer Hyde has been killed. I shall wait for the police here. Yes, sir. Utterson, Esquire, to be opened in the event of my death or disappearance. Henry Jekyll. When you read this, dear friend, I shall be dead. And only this journal will remain to clarify a mystery, to exert a warning. You will recall perhaps a conversation we had two years ago you when you came to see me. Nonsense. And you found Dr. Lanyon and me arguing. My dear Jiggle, you astonish me. A grown man like you talking like a romantic boy. Lanyon, we're scientists. In theory, nothing is impossible. That may be true, but some things are clearly improbable. Your idea is too fantastic. Mr. Utterson to see you, sir. Oh, oh hello, Utterson. Utterson. We're having a row. Oh, so shall we go to law? No, we might need your fine legal mind to arbitrate. Ah, uh, Utterson, Jekyll here has decided to go beyond the science, leaving me oh. far behind. I'm only a doctor. A simple, ordinary doctor. Like me. No. You're not simple, and you're not ordinary. You know what this outrageous fellow proposes to do? Raise the dead? Better than that. He wants to find the soul. He wants to play with it, to experiment you're simply with fine. It. You're simply fine. I merely suggested that one way of discovering the nature of the soul would be to dissect it the way you would any other organism. Yes, but I was under the impression the soul was not tangible. Neither is the air, but we know it exists. We can alter it. See? Fire. We're burning oxygen. This match is creating carbon di dioxide. We've altered a substance no one can see. Well, why not the soul? Why not indeed? But where do you find it? In the mind, I should think. Those parts of the mind which regulate behavior. I would take up this poker, my dear Lanyon, and kill you. Well, I wouldn't put it past you. You're mad as a hatter. I should suffer terrible pangs of conscience afterwards. That would be my soul punishing me. Well, it is a small matter of the law, you know. All right. But suppose the mind could be so changed that I could strike Lanyon to the ground and feel nothing. Only pleasure in a violent act. And there is something, you know, in all of us, a caged beast which delights in horror and destruction. Well, the whole idea is far too fanciful. And slightly unwholesome. Addison, I believe I'm on the track of something quite fantastic. The soul? The soul. Good and evil. I believe it's possible artificially to produce either a monster or an angel in the same man. Rubbish. Where's my tea? I came here for tea, not a black mass. You shall have your tea, my old intolerant friend. Monster or an angel. But do you really believe that human beings are both? I do. Oh, none of us is either very good or very bad. We're just a mixture. A blend, you might say, like... Like Lanyon's beloved China tea. Bring it in for you. But aren't you afraid to upset the balance of a soul? Well, why not? I'd only bring out what was already there, what was good. The angel. Exactly. But suppose you release the monster. Suppose, my dear Jekyll, that you uncaged the monster. That's a risk one would have to take in the interest of science. Science? Jekyll, you're impossible. But the tea? A proper blend, no doubt of it. Milk and sugar? Oh, I saw a client of yours. I was aware I had spoken too soon of my great interest. But I was curious to see how Lanyon and how you, Utterson, would respond to the idea of my experiments. I determined to say nothing more of my work until I was further along. As you remember, that winter we did not meet often. 
I was daily, nightly engaged in my work, my deliberate and hazardous journey into the soul itself. Thank you, Paul. Yes, sir. Uh, sir? Yes, Paul. Sir, don't you think... Well, I mean, it's not my place, but... I work too hard. I need a rest. Exactly, sir. You know, it's not natural, all these hours you spend here. Only today, Dr. Lanyon called and much put out he was too when you wouldn't receive him. Well, Poole, I'll make you a promise. Either I conclude my experiments this week or I give them up altogether. Oh, thank you, sir. It would be a great relief to us all. The staff's fair been out of it. I had no idea when I made Poole my promise that success was at hand. After months of tedious experiment, I had found almost by accident the proper substances which, combined, had the power to split the soul in two. The basic preparation involved a solution in which certain salts were combined and balanced. On this occasion, I added to them one of the new powders brought to me by Poole. The change in the solution's color was not anticipated. For a moment, I hesitated. I had been my own guinea pig from the beginning. I had tried on myself all the formulae which had failed. Now, if I was to succeed, did I dare take the consequences of my extraordinary act? I paused uncertain for a single heart's beat. Then I drank the liquid. For a moment, I thought I was dying, sinking into oblivion. I saw with horror what I had become. I had released not the angel from my soul, but the monster from its pit. The monster, however, had a taste for pleasure. And I indulged him. I could, whenever I chose, become this creature whom I called Mr. Hyde. 
As time passed, I found a strange enjoyment in transforming myself from Jekyll to Hyde. By day, I was the good, kind Dr. Jekyll. By night, I was someone else, a strange, a violent creature. I was the wicked Mr. Hyde. Get out. Hey, now then, what do you think you're doing? I'm sure you'll find another companion. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. I, I, I didn't mean to. I, I, well, well, yes. Sit down, my girl. You're that Mr. Hyde, aren't you? Yes, I'm that Mr. Hyde. What a fine girl you are. They say you're the wickedest man in London. Do they? Do you think I am? Oh, I don't know. But you're awful cheeky pulling me over here like this. A wife from a gentleman friend. But you're glad you're here, aren't you, my girl? Ask me no questions, I'll tell you no lies. Why don't you come a little closer? I'm not sure I want to. Come here. Here now. None of that. I'm not what you think. And it's a public place. I'm, I'm, I'm... Yes, my friend. I realized early that I was involved in an infernal game whose prize was nothing more nor less than my living soul. But I could not help myself. I enjoyed being Mr. Hyde. Hyde was younger, more daring than I. He did all the things I had only contemplated in shameful reveries. And at first, I saw no harm in unleashing Mr. Hyde from time to time. The sense of danger exhilarated me. So it's Mr. Hyde. Come back to us. All right, my girl, let's go. Let's go, he says. Just like that. Just like he was a real fine gentleman or something. You'd better get a move on, mister. Gladly. Shall we move on, my girl? No, we will not. Now off with you. You filthy devil, get out of here! Ah! Filthy devil, did you say?
Good evening, officer. Oh, it's you, Dr. Jekyll. There's something I can do for you, officer. Well, sir, we followed a man called Hyde. As a doctor, area, I realized at that moment that Mr. Hyde had become a disease which I could no longer control. Mr. Hyde was now capable of murder. In just a moment, we'll return to the second act of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And now your host, Bill Lundigan. Each week, Art Gilmore announces at the start of Climax, live from Television City in Hollywood. Well, I thought that you might get a kick out of seeing Television City live from Hollywood. And here it is, Television City. Live from Hollywood. And incidentally, when you think of Hollywood, you think of pictures. Here are some taken of me driving into the studio the other day for a rehearsal. And what a view you get through that wraparound windshield. And sure enough, right on time and driving a DeSoto hard top with that color sweep styling, a pretty lady in a pretty car, Mary Costa. Here comes another member of the team, our commercial producer on the show, and his name is Bud Cole, and as you can plainly see, he owns a Dodge Royal Lancer, and he loves it. Now, here's the man I was talking about who says, live from Television City in Hollywood, Art Gilmore, a Chrysler man from way back, this year driving a New Yorker. And off we go to the studio. Nice looking cars, aren't they? Hi, Mary. And you know something? Whether it's television city in Hollywood or around the square in your own hometown, you're seeing more and more cars of the forward look from Chrysler Corporation. You can spot them at a glance by their smooth, flowing lines. The most distinctively styled cars on the road today. Why don't you drive one and find out what a difference there is? And now we continue with Climax, tonight starring Michael Rennie, Cedric Hardwick, and Mary Sinclair, live from Hollywood. I vowed that never again would I take that potion which every fiber of my body now craved. into the good world again. I saw our old friends. I gave up my time to charity. But I realized that should I ever again become Hyde, I might not be able to return in safety to my own house, especially since the suspicions of the police were already aroused. I should need an ally. Someone who would keep for me the potion I needed to restore myself from Hyde to Jekyll. Oh, Lanyon. Ah, oh, Jekyll. I decided that Dr. Lanyon, in his innocence, was the man. I gave him a package containing the potion. And I asked him to give it to a Mr. Hyde, should that gentleman ever call. He'd only come to you if I was inaccessible. Well... All this seems to make very little sense, but I'll give it to him, of course. When does he have to call? Never, I hope. Confess now, dear Dr. Jekyll. Your ears have been burning, uh, haven't they? Pleasantly, I hope. <laughs> I've been telling Lady the Agnes that you worked far too hard. Oh, so, yes, indeed. We Suddenly, must... like a black cloud across the sun, their faces grew dim. Their chatter like the noise of starlings, and I knew I could not endure them for another moment. <laughs> thing to do. Well, you see, overwork. I'm sure of it. He looks frightful. Well, I imagine the party's over, don't you? Oh, yes. <laughs>
out of your silly mind. I thought at first he was fooling me. Till he takes me straight to meet his old mum. Then, of course, I said yes, just like that. Oh, you are a lucky one. I should think so. And he's a good, reliable sortie as he works regular, which is important, I say. You're right. They don't grow his kind on no tree. Don't think I don't know it. Hello, Harry. Is he coming here tonight? Neddy lucky and he don't approve. <laughs> Ain't it something? Me being married to a fine chap in Tunbridge Well. I suppose you're going to live there. Those are our plans for the present. Oh, and aren't we grand? When's the nuptial going to be? Next month. And we'll go to Brighton on our honeymoon. Three days. It'll be three old days for the sea. Oh, some girls have all the luck. <laughs> oh, look over there by the door. Ain't that Mr. I? Him all right, beast. Imagine his daring show his ugly face around here after what happened between him and us. Smile, my girl. Aren't you glad to see your old friend? This girl's no friend of yours, so just find somebody else to bother. But I want to bother you, my girl. I'm sure you've missed me. Let's have a little wine in that booth over there. I'm waiting for my fiancé and have no time for strange men who don't behave themselves proper. Come. Who do you think you are now? The only one who's good enough for you. <laughs> Some poor fool's making an honest woman of you. Don't talk to me like that. You like being talked to that way. Your man doesn't know how to talk to you. I do, but your man doesn't. Please, Mr. Hart. Please. I can't stay here with you. You stay here with your friend, your only friend. Please, Mr. Hart. I've got to go. I, you I, don't like me? Oh, I do. I like you. I do like you, but my girlfriend's wife, and she's over there expecting You'll not leave here till I say you can. You and I are going to see a great deal of each other from now on. Oh! I'm so glad you're here. Where's my girl? She said she'd be here tonight. She was waiting for you. Then he came in, Mr. Hyde, and they're sitting over there. Oh, so he came back, did he? But he's going to get taught a lesson. Don't be careful. Quickly. Here I am over here talking to Mr. Hyde. Oh, Mr. Hyde. I really must Sit be going. down, my girl. She's going, Hyde. Go away. Listen, you. You're going to get a good trashing, and I'm going to give it. <coughs> We've at his funeral, my girl. such thing. You, sir, are a murderer. It is my duty to report you to the police. Get that package. You can't intimidate me. You promise, Chico. Now get me that package. Then call the police if you like. I will not be an accomplice to murder. How do you know it was murder? The newspapers. The name of your friendship with Chico give me that package. Go to him yourself. I can't. No, of course you can't. He won't traffic with the killer and neither will I. In the name of everything you love, give me that package. I will not help you. Get it?
Please go. Now, Mac. You who have always had such narrow views. You who have always derided my theories. Behold. Is this witchcraft? No. Science. The blackest magic of all. I've gone mad. This is a dream, a nightmare. No, it's true. I am Dr. Chico. And I am Mr. Hyde. I can't believe it. You've seen it. No. What have you done then? Fallen into the pit. You. You are a murderer. Yes. Yes, Mr. Hyde killed a man last night, and I am a murderer. But, who are you? How can you be two men? Remember when it started, Lenny? Remember what I told you? That each man has both a monster and an angel. Through science, he could be either. I succeeded, Lenny. I uncaged a beast, a horror. Surely once you did this thing, it was enough. Thought so. Thought so, but I couldn't stop it. I tried, but I couldn't. Lenny, there's something in me which craves to be hide, and I can't stop it. terrible thing again? I don't know. I can't think. Is it like a drug? Must you become Hyde in spite of your better self? I'm not sure. But I know this. If I do this thing again, I shall die. I'm being torn apart by this beast. Then, Jiko, I think it better that you die. You say this to your friend, your old friend. I say it because you are my old friend. Because your soul may soon be lost forever if it's not already damned. Am I Jekyll responsible for what Hyde does? Can I help what this brute does? You are Hyde. You chose of your own will to be Hyde. So you are a murderer and a blasphemer. I only wanted to find the soul as an experiment. You found the soul. You experimented. You've gone further than any man was meant to go. Your fate is no longer for man to decide. And him. And in I'll never take that potion again, I swear it. The damage is done. The corruption has already started. And 
I'll devote my life to others. I'll do more than that. I'll work in the charity hospitals. I'll do anything you say, Landon. Do what you must. Never see me again. Landon. You'd better go now. Landon, you and I are old friends. We have nothing to do with this other creature, Hyde. You are Hyde. But so are you. Every man has a hide within him. I have kept mine caged. I did what I did out of curiosity, out of innocence. Innocent? You meddling fool. You have dared to challenge God. You reek of hell. Get out. Get out. Or... a moment, we will return to the third act of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And now, once again, your host, Bill Lundigan. In the course of a year's driving, you naturally run into a lot of different road conditions, and not all of them are ideal. For example, here's the kind of driving that we all enjoy. We're on a wide, smooth highway. You're really rolling along with never a bump. But now and then, you're likely to encounter a stretch like this. And believe me, the going can get rough. So, Chrysler Corporation engineers decided to find a way to give you a ride that will be smooth on rough, rutted roads as well as on a boulevard. And here is the secret. This is an AuraFlow shock absorber. It was developed by Chrysler Corporation exclusively for Chrysler Corporation cars. And it may look just like an ordinary shock absorber, but it definitely is not. <laughs> For this unique AuraFlow shock absorber is built to absorb more pounding and bouncing on a rough road like this than any other passenger car shock absorber in the industry. The AuraFlow shock absorber literally soaks up the bumps, keeping your car level on its course and the ride soft, smooth, and beautifully controlled. We call it the Boulevard Ride, and believe me, that's the right name for it. You get a ride that's as soft and smooth as a feather bed. And here's a tiny tot enjoying to the full the ride of her mother's new Chrysler Corporation car. And there you have it. The smoothest, easiest riding cars on the road today. Thanks to the only shock absorbers in the industry that give you a real boulevard ride. And right now is a wonderful time to buy a Chrysler Corporation car. You'll find your dealer is eager to arrange the best possible trade-in and best possible payments. So... Why not see him tomorrow? And now, we return to Climax. I refuse to accept Lanyon's grim analysis. I refuse to be defeated. With all the strength and will left in me, I did my best to atone for my unholy deeds. But, like any criminal, there were loose ends to be attended to. I was forced to deal with the police. In Dr. Jekyll's laboratory several months ago. He and Dr. Jekyll were quite friendly, weren't they? It would be presumptuous of me to say, I shall get the doctor. Good evening, officer. Oh, sorry to trouble you again, Dr. Jekyll. That's perfectly all right. Won't you sit down? No, oh, thank you, sir. You uh, know about the murder in Soho? Uh, yes, I read about it. We understand that Hyde was a friend of yours. Not a friend, no. But you were acquainted with him. Yes. Why didn't you tell me about this the night I first came to your laboratory? Because you never asked me. You simply asked if Hyde was concealed on the premises, and I said no, because he wasn't. You were not concealing him? No. And you're not concealing him now? No, I am not. You may search the house. Thank you, sir. We, we plan to. Now, Dr. Jekyll, this man I'd obviously strikes me as the sort of chap a man like you would know. Really? Can you tell me what you know of him? Not much, officer. You see, I do a certain amount of research into the, well, into the criminal mind. I used Hyde as an experiment, as an example. Any idea where he's gone? No, but I don't think he's apt to return to London. Then he has left the city? I should think so. You know, Dr. Jekyll, 
You could be in very serious trouble if you were to try to protect or conceal him now. Yes, I know that. Can I speak to you frankly, sir? Yes. Well, this man eyed. He doesn't have anything on you, does he? I mean, he's not an extortionist or a blackmailer. <laughs> Good heavens, no, officer. Now, I detest the fellow quite as much as you do, and I'm free to denounce him if you should capture him. Good. I'm glad we can count on you. Now, have you any idea where he might have gone? Well, as I told the you... The police were less problem than I'd anticipated. They believed that in some way I'd been victimized by the odious Hyde. And after a thorough search of my house, they left me alone. As time passed, they gave up their quest for Hyde, assuming he had left the country. I destroyed all my drugs and compounds to safeguard myself against all relapse. Now I would turn to charity, to good works as I had promised Lanny. I grew more and more secure. I had caged Hyde once and for all, and I was myself again. So confident was I that I paid a call one evening to a certain cabaret in Soho. I wish I was dead too. Come now. You're still young and attractive, and you've got ever so many admirers. I only wanted him. Come on now, perk up. Perk up. Oh, here comes a top. He's coming over this way. I think he's going to come and talk to you. You mark my word. Good evening. Good evening. Excuse me, I'll just go and join my friend. May I sit down? Suit yourself. You're not waiting for anyone? No, I'm not waiting. It's a pleasant evening. Yes, a pleasant evening. Oh, wait, a champagne case. Yes, sir. You're the girl who was fiancé. I had come partly out of curiosity and partly out of a desire to make amends. To help in some practical way this girl. A terrible experience. Whose life I'd ruined. Was and he fell dead. Right here in this room. Dead. We was to be married in three weeks' time. The trip to Brighton on our honeymoon. I'm sorry. Sorry? How can the likes of you know what it is to have your life end? But your life's not over. Not over, is it? How many chances do you think a girl down here has of a decent marriage? I'm sure you'll have many more. I should have known when I first saw him. What he'd do. What he was. Your fiancé? No, the other. Mr. Hyde. I could get my hands on him right now. I'd twist a knife in his heart. Was he so terrible? He was like the devil himself. So very bad. He was worse than bad. He was so... so hateful. He, he attracted you. I'm sure he's miles away by now. I try they catch him and hang him by his neck. Have you any idea where he's gone? Who knows? I suppose you read all about it in the papers. There it all was. My name and everything, just like the Queen's name. There I was. Here. You can see some of the things they say about the horrible crime and so on. My name spelled wrong in the early editions, but they got it right, right. Yes, I read these at the time. Oh, I don't know what my poor mum would have said. She'd seen her daughter's name like that. Of course, it was on the same page as the Queen's. My mum's dead. 
Would you like a little champagne? All right. That's a nice drink. I'd like to help you if you'll allow me. You know, none of that. Why, I don't know who you are. I'm just an idle philanthropist. Oh. That's different. But don't get no ideas about me, even if I was involved in a crime of passion. I say, it's awful odd, a gentleman like you down here. Oh, well, you see, I'm a doctor. I do charity work in these parts. Oh, that explains it. I bet you're a good doctor. You really must be the kind As we of talked, I found her oddly attractive. Well, I'm sure you are. And I resolved to help her in any way I could. As we chatted, even the cabaret seemed less tawdry and disagreeable. A sister of mine in Norfolk needs a housekeeper. I'm sure you'd like her very much. You're not just playing with me. No. I mean it. And no obligations. Oh, I sigh. This beats everything. Are you feeling all right? Yes, it's just a headache. As for the heat in here, it's very close. Would you like to take a turn outside? No, no, thank you. A strange sense of unreality while we talked. I would appreciate that. As though I was seeing the world through a heavy, muffling veil. Say, you do look rum. Yes, I, I'm not... I'm not feeling very hearty. Shall I get you a cab? Yes. Well, we'll take a drive, my girl. What did you say? You heard. You sounded just like him for a moment. You frightened my girl. without wanting to, without having first taken the potion. With every ounce of will left to me, I forced myself, I forced the evil hide to return to the laboratory. And desperately, I searched for the chemicals necessary to transform me back into myself. But there was none left. All had been destroyed. morning, however, I found I was again myself. I was again Dr. Jekyll. I gave Poole various instructions. He was to go to the chemists. He was to order the ingredients I needed for my compound. I spoke urgently, for I had no idea when I might again become that monster whose evil power over me was nearly complete. I don't want to see anyone, Poole. I'll be working in my laboratory for the next while. You bring my meals, just leave them outside the door. Very good, sir. One fool. I want the door into the laboratory. The one that leads into the street. I want it padlocked. Yes, sir. From the outside. From the outside, yes, sir. Fool, and you keep the key. I shan't need it. Yes, sir. I took every precaution to keep the monster caged, at least within the house. So far, I have. Though the nightmare is now becoming more than I can endure. I no longer know which I am. Jekyll or Hyde. It was soon evident that the most necessary ingredient, a certain salt, was no longer available at any chemist's. It had been a flawed chemical, an impure salt. 
and its very impurity made it impossible to duplicate. No luck, sir. They say the sorts you've got are the same as they've always sent. Tell them they lie. Tell them to look again. Tell them to order more. Yes, sir, I, I will. now for some days that I shall never leave this room alive. I have given up all hope. My life is now a battleground where good and evil are at war, and the victory of either one will mean my death. So great has been my sin. Police officer, Mr. Utterson. The body's in here, officer. Well, we'll have a look and then I'll take your testimony. Who will ask me to come? It's all over now. You know too, then? Yes. It's all in here. He left this journal for me. It's a perfectly clear case of self-defense, isn't it, Mr. Utterson? What? Oh, yes, that's quite correct. He assaulted me with criminal intent. But what's he done with Dr. Jekyll? That's the important thing. The whole matter is out of our hands. Ah, that it is. Well, Mr. Ride, you got what was coming to you. That's certain. No, officer. That's not Mr. Hyde. That's Dr. Jekyll. What are you saying, sir? I saw him with my own eyes. It look, was Mr. Hyde. Look and see. What? It is Dr. Jekyll. I don't understand. The beast and the monster. The angel. It was an unholy thing he did, separating them. True. True. But only the good remains. a rather unique fashion show for you this evening. Now, maybe the fashion shows you're used to seeing feature what the best-dressed man or woman is wearing today. But this fashion show we call what the best-dressed car is wearing, and here's Mary Costa to tell you all about it. Thank you, Bill. Here you see a full array of custom accessories from the Mopar division of Chrysler Corporation. That's Mo for motor, par for part. These accessories are the smartest, most durable, and most fashion right that you can get for your car. And you can get them in a minute in your own neighborhood. But now, let's go to the home plant of Mopar at Centerline, Michigan. This is Mopar, the most efficient parts plant in the industry, where 2,000 employees work to handle each order the day it arrives, whether by teletype, by wire, or by mail. Here is where emergency orders are received, every dealer knowing he can phone direct. All orders are checked against microfilm records that show the original specifications of every Chrysler Corporation car or truck. The order is then broken down electronically into year, make, model of car, and part or accessory needed. After this, the order is taken to the pneumatic tube system to be instantly whisked to a clearing center in the plant called Grand Central. Every order must arrive here and then be routed by skilled operators to exactly the right point in this vast warehouse that covers almost a million square feet. An important division of Chrysler Corporation, Mopar serves your car needs from coast to coast. To handle your demand nationwide, over 100 truck and freight car loads of parts and accessories leave Mopar daily. And of course, the best part is you can get these custom fashion-wise accessories and factory approved parts at your dealers, at service stations, and at thousands of general garages all over the country. And in every case, Mary, you can be sure that every Mopar part or accessory is designed and built to the same rigid specifications and the same high standards of quality as the cars themselves. Remember, Mopar division of Chrysler Corporation, a forward look in service. Thank you very much, Mary Costa. Right, Bill. 
Ladies and gentlemen, next week on Climax, One Night Stand, starring Bob Crosby and the Bobcats, John Forsythe, Bob Sweeney, Boris Leachman, and Donald Buca. Hey, hey, what's going on here? Well, that's a gin mill blues. Bring back any memories? I have willingly, willingly, willingly. It is my old Marine Corps friend, Bob Crosby. Semper Fi, Bill. Semper Fi to you, too. And incidentally, speaking of the Marine Corps, mm -hmm. don't I remember that uh, one time back during our Marine Corps years, we were in the Russell Islands on Benico, wasn't That's it? That's right, right out of Bububu. Uh, Bububu. Mm -hmm. And I asked you if you were ever going to get back together with the original Bobcats. Pretty tricky, pretty tricky, Willie, to tell the folks out there that we are next Thursday on this same show, the Bobcats 15 strong. And Bill, I'm very, very complimented to have, playing the part of Joe Sullivan, our piano player, mm -hmm. the wonderful, wonderful actor, John Forsythe. John? Hi, John, Bill come Lundy. on in, John. Hi, Bill. Thank you for those kind words, Brother Robert. Met him. <laughs> you know that I was just telling Bob this afternoon, what a real treat this is for me to play this show. Mm -hmm. Because first of all, Bill, I've always been crazy about jazz. And secondly, because I think this is a true and completely different kind of a story about the men who make music. Well, it sounds to me as though we're going, we're really going to have an excellent show next week. Well, I certainly hope so, and I hope the folks out there are going to like it. We're going to play Little Rock Getaway, Gin Mill Blues. Say, Rob, 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 Rob. Yes, sir. Let me ask you something, please. Mm -hmm. Who do you think we ought to get to play the part of um, Bob Crosby? Well, I wonder. It would be awfully nice if Brother Bing did. Bing, Bing Crosby. Yeah. Well, I think he should. After all, I played his life many, many times. Goodbye, Bill. See you later. See you. Goodbye, Rob. See you later. Next week, and John. We'll all be looking forward to seeing you and the Bobcats next week in One Night Stand, also starring John Forsythe, Bob Sweeney, Floris Leachman, and Donald Booker. This is Bill Lundigan saying thank you, and don't miss it. has been brought to you by Chrysler Corporation, maker of these five great cars. Plymouth, Dodge, DeSoto, Chrysler, and the exclusive Imperial. Only Chrysler Corporation brings you the forward look. Art Gilmore speaking, Chrysler Corporation's Climax has been selected for viewing by America's Armed Forces Overseas and is a CBS Television Network production. <laughs>